Item number, SCP-299, Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. A 200-meter-wide forest of SCP-299 is to be contained in an underground biodome, Area 299, in the desert. All other specimens encountered are to be incinerated. No plant life is to come into contact with SCP-299 outside of controlled testing. Areas infested by SCP-299 should be considered Class 8 hazard zones, firebombed immediately, and monitored for four weeks. Any further infestation is to be incinerated, as well as all wildlife present on the site. Description SCP-299 is an arboriform organism characterized by black, sharp-pointed branches. Closer inspection reveals that each instance of SCP-299 is connected to neighboring trees by its roots. Prolonged contact converts these neighboring trees into another instance of SCP-299. This is SCP-299's only known method of reproduction. Addendum 2991 SCP-299 infection will result from prolonged contact with any material from SCP-299. Conversion time varies by the size of the infectee. Generally, after a few minutes of exposure, the infected plant begins to shed its leaves. Low branches shift downward to a height of 30 to 100 centimeters and taper to a point. High branches retain leaves and shift towards the top of the tree forming a dense canopy and making overhead identification impossible. Addendum 2992 Microscopic analysis of low branches reveals that these points are composed of the same material as the rest of the infected plant and are remarkably sharp. Direct contact with the point of a branch from SCP-299 is unadvised, as even a sliver of SCP-299 material embedded in skin is known to produce disastrous results. Vine-like tendrils grow upward from the roots of SCP-299, reaching heights of up to 2 meters. These tendrils are prehensile and elastic. Organic objects entering close proximity are violently seized, impaled upon the lower branches, and incorporated into the organism via gradual conversion on the molecular level. Specimens of SCP-299 release chemicals known to spread throughout the immediate area and cause heightened paranoia and aggression in most animals, including humans. Under the influence of these chemicals, groups of people tend to split up and wander the forest alone, making them more likely to pass through an infested area. Addendum 2993 Examination of material harvested from SCP-299 reveals that the wood is brittle and similar in composition to data expunged. A single cell of SCP-299 will retain its infectious nature and is capable of reconfiguring an entire organism upon introduction. Experiment Log 2991 Item Maple Seedling Acer Saccharum One Specimen Researcher, Dr. Test record. A sample of matter from SCP-299 is introduced to seedling. Over 45 minutes, the seedling is completely converted into a specimen of SCP-299, retaining its height and approximate size. Seedling incinerated. Item, Oak Tree, Quercus Alba. One specimen. Researcher, Dr. Test record. Oak tree transplanted into containment area of SCP-299. Over three hours, the tree is completely converted into a specimen of SCP-299, retaining its height and approximate size. Matter taken from new specimen is consistent with matter from neighboring specimens. Item. Sunflower. Helianthus annuus. One specimen. Researcher. Dr. Test record. A sample of matter from SCP-299 is introduced to Sunflower. Over 10 minutes, the plant is completely converted into a specimen of SCP-299, retaining its height and size. 
The flower petals have blackened and tapered into spikes, consistent with SCP-299 spike branches. Tendrils are frail and incapable of grasping large objects. Specimen's trunk snapped upon introduction of researcher's foot. Remains incinerated. Item. European grapevine. Vitis vinifera. Confined to pot and growing upward along a trellis. One specimen. Researcher. Dr. Test record. Sample of matter from SCP-299 introduced a grapevine. Subject converted within 30 minutes. Subject detached from trellis and adopted prehensile nature of SCP-299 tendrils. Spike protrudes from rooted area. Item. Results of previous experiment. Pig. Sus domestica. One specimen. Researcher. Dr. Test record. Pig introduced to testing area. Subject showed signs of agitation. Upon investigation of SCP-299, subject was violently seized and constricted, eventually suffocating before impalement upon a spike. Specimen was left in containment and observed for three days. Over that time, the mass of pig and tendril tissues were integrated into the main vine. Spikes grew from its base, the roots extended and tendrils grew from them, and branches grew from the top of the tree, sprouting buds and leaves. Specimen was incinerated. Notes SCP-299 appears to not be limited to trees. Infected plants seem to react slightly differently, depending on their unique biology. All specimens, however, eventually become SCP-299 trees, if given time to grow and change form. Item Venus flytrap Dianea muscipula One specimen Researcher Dr. Test record Data expunged Addendum 2994 O5 Command has requested that researchers refrain from experimentation with carnivorous plants. Item Pig Sus domestica One specimen Researcher Dr. Test record. Matter from SCP-299 injected into Pig. Pig began squealing and moving uncontrollably, until it fell to the ground and convulsed. Upon expiration, fine root-like hairs were observed to grow from the underside of the pig. The flesh of the pig underwent a transformation into SCP-299 material, starting from point of injection. After two hours, the pig was observed to have become another instance of SCP-299, complete with tendrils and leaves. Subject incinerated. Addendum 2995. As of 2000, the trees in Area 299 have begun deviating from the standard form of SCP-299, with several growing what appears to be white flowers, up to two meters from ground level. Following standard protocol, D-Class personnel were sent in to determine if the new mutation was dangerous. Upon approaching the flowers, the petals unfurled into highly mobile tendrils, which immediately ensnared the head of one of the D-Class before pulling him back to the tree. All personnel were immediately removed from the area and placed in a 48-hour quarantine. Subject was observed emerging from the tree line approximately five hours after being ensnared apparently unharmed. Subject was then put in a separate 48-hour quarantine in accordance to protocol. Subject protested vocally against the quarantine, stating that he had to see the sun. Ten hours into the quarantine, Subject spontaneously lost consciousness, and several branches of SCP-299 began growing from Subject's head and torso. Subject was terminated and then incinerated along with the growths. Changes to the containment protocol to respond to this development are under review. Item number SCP-307 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-307 is to be kept within a 0.5 meter square stainless steel planter within a hydroponic growth chamber 
equipped with remotely operated light and sprinkler. The sides of the planter are to be equipped with retractable circular blades, the controls to which must be located outside the containment cell and manned at all times. The hydroponic chamber is to be kept within a 5 meter by 5 meter by 3 meter room with stainless steel walls, floor, and ceiling. There are to be no windows in the room. All light will come from the hydroponic grow light, and any observation of SCP-307 is to be done over a security camera. The temperature of the room is to be kept at 15 degrees Celsius to discourage seed production. If entry to SCP-307's room is necessary, it is to be done by remotely operated robots. Absolutely no living humans are to enter SCP-307's containment cell following Incident 307. If any specimens of SCP-307 are discovered outside the containment cell, they are to be burned immediately until only ashes remain. Any personnel who touches SCP-307 must also be burned. Description SCP-307 is a creeping vine, similar in appearance to the common English ivy, heterohelix, save for the presence of greenish thorns on the stems and the tendency of the leaves to exhibit a purple hue. The vine puts down roots approximately every 30.5 centimeters or 12 inches. The roots can penetrate any porous material, but not metal. Any part of the plant not connected to a root system is to be considered dead and safe to examine up close. SCP-307 appears to be carnivorous and seems to exhibit some degree of intelligence. When in the presence of a warm-blooded animal, hereafter referred to as the victim, it grows at a startlingly rapid rate in the direction of the animal, often growing three vines at a time in what appears to be a flanking maneuver. Upon contact, SCP-307 appears to paralyze the victim and then liquefy and drain all internal organs, musculature, and blood. The mechanisms by which it does this are presently unknown. They have, however, led to researchers calling it Spider Ivy. SCP-307 was first discovered by Agent Apocalemer, in where he witnessed it rapidly growing up the trunk of a tree and consuming a nest of American robins. Further examination has revealed the prevalence of the plant throughout North America. It has shown itself to be highly resistant to any attempts at poisoning. This has included all commercially available herbicides, exposure to allelopathic plants, and formaldehyde. Except for the sample obtained for study, the plant has been burned wherever it has been encountered. However, it is very likely that numerous specimens still exist outside of Foundation control. SCP-307 is only kept alive in the hopes of engineering a biological agent to use on the wild population. Document Number 307A Experiment Logs Experiment 1 Tray of Mealworms Introduced to Cell Result SCP showed no signs of movement. Experiment 2 Chilean Rosehair Tarantula Introduced Result SCP showed no signs of movement. Did not respond when Tarantula climbed onto SCP. Experiment 3 Live Mouse Introduced to Cell Result SCP immediately began to grow in the direction of the mouse. One vine extended directly towards it, while two more grew around and in front of it, effectively surrounding the mouse. Mouse immediately became rigid and stopped moving upon contact with SCP-307. Behavior continued for 26 seconds before mouse fell on its side, obviously dead. Vines outside the planter were severed, allowing D-Class personnel to collect the mouse. Upon retrieval, mouse was noted to appear to be lacking any anatomic structure besides skin and bones. Mouse was taken for further examination. When mouse was dissected, researchers noted a complete absence of blood, internal organs, and musculature. All interior structures were instead replaced with a system of roots, which researchers traced back to the mouse's skull. A single seed was found inside the mouse's otherwise empty brain cavity. Mouse was subsequently burned. Experiment 4 
Jar containing 130 aphids introduced. Additional camera added for close-up viewing. Result. Aphids proceeded to attach themselves to SCP-307 and feed. SCP-307 did not respond in any visible manner. All aphids were dead within five minutes of first feeding. Potential for use as insecticide noted. Addendum 1. Notes of interest taken by Agent Apocalemer during observation of SCP-307. The energy necessary to facilitate such a rapid growth rate would be astronomical, yet SCP-307 seems able to pursue prey regardless of available light or time since it last fed. The behavior exhibited by SCP-307 during Incident 307 would suggest the presence of some kind of botanical muscle. Examination of severed vines has revealed no structure that could conceivably serve this purpose. Addendum 2. In light of Incident 307, SCP-307 has been upgraded to Keter class. Appropriate adjustments to containment protocol have been made. See Incident Report 307 for more details. Incident Report 307 SCP Involved SCP-307 Date Undisclosed Location Bioresearch Area Description Incident Log As compiled by Agent Apocalemer, Agent in Charge of Containment and Research on SCP-307 the following is a description of security camera footage from SCP-307's containment cell on the morning of date undisclosed. 8.01 AM Close-up observation camera in SCP-307's hydroponic chamber goes offline. 8.12 AM Personnel D-104 and D-127 enter SCP-307's containment cell to repair camera. 8.13.02 AM D-104 begins transfer of SCP-307 to secure lockbox, as per protocol. 8.13.42 AM D-104 places SCP-307 in secure lockbox. 8.13.44 AM D-104 freezes in place. 8.13.47 AM D-127 is heard to inquire as to D-104's well-being. 8.13.50 AM D-127 begins fumbling with his flamethrower, seemingly in a state of panic. 8.13.51 AM A vine from SCP-307, Vine A, is seen to grow in D-127's direction. 8.13.55 AM Personnel activate security saws in SCP-307's planter. Vine appears unaffected. 8.14 AM the gas line of D-127's flamethrower is severed by one of SCP-307's thorns. 8.14.02 AM D-127 flees the room in panic. SCP-307 does not attempt to pursue. 8.14.15 AM D-104 falls over, limp, presumed dead at this point. A second vine, Vine B, is visible, hanging over the edge of the lockbox. 8.14.21 AM Vines begin to grow in the direction of the door to the holding cell. 8.14.24 AM Emergency saws are again activated. Vine B is severed. Vine A is not. 8.14.30 AM Vine A begins growing in direction of Security Camera 1. 8.14.51 AM Security Camera 1 goes offline. Security Camera 2 remains online. 8.15.33 AM Three D-Class personnel enter containment cell. 8.15.36 AM Vine A assumes position similar to defensive posture of a Cobra. 8.15.41 AM Unidentified D-Class personnel sets fire to Vine A. 8.15.43 AM Emergency saws are activated again. Vine A is severed. 8.15.46 AM Same D-Class personnel manages to close lockbox. Other two remove D-104's body. 8.30.02 AM Autopsy begins on D-104. 
Autopsy results revealed Vine B had entered a small hole next to the faceplate on Personnel D-104's insulating bodysuit. Personnel's body was found to be in a state similar to that of the mouse, described in Document 307-A. No internal structure, aside from skeleton, could be found, replaced by an elaborate network of roots, all connected to a seed located in D-104's skull. A pair of shoots had begun to sprout in the direction of the eye sockets. D-104 was summarily incinerated. Item Number SCP-324 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures While SCP-324 does not require efforts beyond basic botanical maintenance to thrive, access to its products are to be strictly controlled to prevent theft and possible uncontrolled cultivation. SCP-324 is to be contained within a secure solarium or equivalent agricultural facility in a minimum of 5 cubic meters of soil. Soil should be maintained at a consistent pH of between 4 and 4.5 with a minimum 12% humus or similar organic compound component to topsoil. A misting system or other remote means of watering should be implemented to minimize the number of staff with access to SCP-324. SCP-324 is currently held at Site-23, Solarium-16, Bay-194, under these conditions. As on-site staff already have access to specialized botanical testing equipment and methodologies via the containment of SCP-38. Transfer of SCP-324 to another facility is subject to Level 4 approval. Products of SCP-324, designated SCP-3241, may be transferred between research staff as necessary with Level 3 approval. To maintain SCP-324 as the only mature specimen during initial research, attempts to cultivate further specimens from SCP-3241 off-site are currently suspended. Description SCP-324 is a small, evergreen shrub, currently 1.4 meters in height and possessing a complex root system that extends approximately 2.5 meters below the soil. Leaves are lanceolate, ranging between 4 and 6 centimeters in width. During the flowering phase, SCP-324 produces small, 14 to 22 millimeters, white flowers with 9 petals. Berries produced by SCP-324 are designated SCP-3241 and appear pinkish-white in color, with diameters between 9 and 14 millimeters. Berries are edible, with flavor reported as tart and mildly sweet. SCP-324's flowering and berry-producing phase are apparently only initiated by the introduction of a deceased mammal of at least 25 kilograms into its soil. The mammal must be within range of SCP-324's root system and been deceased no longer than three days at the time of its first contact with SCP-324. If these conditions are met, the flowering phase will begin within 16 hours of introduction, with mature flowers in SCP-3241 appearing within 75 hours. When eaten, each individual sample of SCP-3241 will produce a vivid sensory experience reenacting a seemingly random memory of the deceased mammal's life in the consumer of SCP-3241. In tests with human cadavers buried in SCP-324's soil, consumers of SCP-3241 report clear oral and visual impressions, including specific locations, conversations, and individuals. The consumer of SCP-3241 appears to experience the deceased's memory as if it were one of their own, but recognizes it as a product of another mind. In tests featuring animal cadavers, consumers of SCP-3241 report an overwhelming jumble of sensory input, devoid of the usual narrative context produced by human thought. Each experience lasts between two and four minutes before it subsides. If multiple samples of SCP-3241 are ingested at one time, memories experienced proceed one at a time, each with the same 2-4 to four minute window. SCP-324 produces SCP-3241 for approximately one week, regardless of the type or mass of the deceased mammal introduced into its soil. After this period has elapsed, all samples of SCP-3241 wither and become inert, 
until another deceased mammal is accessed by the root system. Animals incapable of creating memories are lacking memories of their own, such as subjects of SCP-909, likewise produce inert samples of SCP-3241. Discovery SCP-324 was discovered in a small cemetery, specializing in natural, coffinless and non-preservational burial in rural County, New Hampshire. The groundskeeper, a Mr. Declan, would regularly transplant SCP-324 to the graves of the newly deceased and invite surviving family members to partake of SCP-3241 for a substantial fee. The scheme was discovered inadvertently when Agent attended services at the cemetery for his deceased relative. Upon a demonstration of SCP-3241's effects, Agent immediately took both Mr. Declan, assigned D-Class, and SCP-324 into Foundation custody. Mr. Declan claimed the shrub had been on the grounds when they were purchased in 19 and knew nothing further of its origins. Addendum Experiment Logs 324-42.4 through 324-45.2 SCP-3241 Consumer Male D-Class Number 67531 Age 56 Soil Input Human Female Aged 34 at TOD Deceased 2 days Experience Report D-67531 placid for duration of experience. Recounts an afternoon picnic from the perspective of a small female child, including impressions of flying a kite and eating a celery stalk with peanut butter and raisins. SCP-3241 Consumer Female D-Class Number 58563 Age 34 Soil Input Chimpanzee Female Aged 44 at TOD, deceased 3 days. Experience Report D-58563 thrashes wildly for the duration of the experience, making gestures as if to ward off an attacker. Recounts impression of being assaulted by multiple individuals, uttering high-pitched squeals. SCP-3241 Consumer Male D-Class Number 69965 Age 22. Soil Input Human Female Aged 93 at TOD Deceased 2 days Experience Report D-69965 Uncooperative Restraints Employed D-69965 Force-Fed SCP-3241 Continues thrashing for 43 seconds before abruptly relaxing Eyes glazed for duration of experience. D-69965 drools slightly. Recounts staring out a window from a wheelchair at a busy urban street, sprinklers occasionally splashing the window. SCP-3241 Consumer Female D-Class Number 39395 Age 42 Soil Input Dolphin Male Aged 19 at TOD. Deceased one day. Experience Report D-39395 holds breath for duration of experience. Passes out at 97 seconds. Revived. Recounts impressions of swimming, darkness, pressure. Claims to distinctly recall speaking to another individual, but cannot remember content of conversation. Item Number SCP-355 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All specimens of SCP-355 are to be kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter plot of ground, in a small terrarium in Site-19, and watered daily. This section is to be kept with minimal air movement, to prevent accidental release of seeds, and provided with Standard Atmospheric Mixture Number 14. Dim red light is to be maintained in the room. Access to the room is to be granted by Dr. Fizewell, and tests are to be performed under his supervision. All visitors are required to wear a thick-soled environment suit for the duration of the visit. The entrance to the room is to be secured with an airlock and fan system to prevent the accidental release of seeds. Description 
SCP-355 is an unknown species indistinguishable to the naked eye from ordinary grass, but its nearest known genetic relation is the mahogany taxon. A hollow core of cellulose and buckminster fullerene runs through the center of each blade to maintain the grass's vertical structure, and each vein in the leaf is sheathed in a similar core, resulting in an unusually inflexible grass, sharp enough on the outside to pierce light wood and some plastics. The main blade performs photosynthesis and absorbs atmospheric nutrients as usual. Root structure is unusually deep for a short plant, but otherwise normal. However, the species seems to have developed in a low-energy environment, as photosynthetic rates under standard Earth atmospheric conditions are inordinately high and accelerate the species' reproductive cycle causing rapid generation and dispersal of grass seed, each cycle occurring approximately once every two weeks. This hypothesis is supported by the passive carnivorism, similar to that of the sundew or cobra lily, also from environments low in nutrition. Any creature with insufficiently armored feet that treads on the grass suffers the penetration of their feet by the dense blades, a light liquefying acid and subsequent drainage of bodily fluids through the hollow core. The plant simultaneously deploys sharp splinters from its edges in reaction to the sudden pressure, making it difficult for the victim to move away. Attempts to do so usually result in pulling the leaf from its root structure, resulting in continued siphoning through the severed stem, or at least severe lacerations to the feet. In order to maintain the species in its containment chamber, the light has been dimmed to levels that prevent atypical growth patterns, and the atmosphere has been appropriately saturated with the necessary nutrients for proper development. SCP-355 was first discovered by accident, following the invasion of a storage facility used by the Chaos Insurgency in Alberta, disguised as an ordinary if moderately secluded local residence. During the post-combat evaluations, Several casualties were left unaccounted for until discovered on the front lawn, drained of their fluids and being slowly digested, near a wooden sign clearly labeled, Please Keep Off the Grass. The area covered by the plant was determined by the scattering of meat chunks, and a plot of ground was removed for study before the eradication of the remaining area. In this and subsequent encounters with Chaos Insurgency installations, SCP-355 has been successfully destroyed by oxygen poisoning, heavy flame, anti-organic acids, and, in one instance, a variety of commandeered domestic ungulates. SCP-355 seems to be negligibly affected by poisons, including data expunged in the form of tainted meat, vaporous herbicides, or soil toxification. Memo. SCP-355 was not among the SCPs stolen from the Foundation during its schism with the Chaos Insurgency and was therefore acquired by them sometime after. Its origin is unknown, although documents seized during suggest it may have been one of several objects deposited by SCP-CI-103. Item Number SCP-376 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-376 is to remain in the secure agriculture facility at site It is to be linked to a single underground electric cable that is to be powered by a single generator, not attached to the main power grid. There is no need for any additional security measures to contain SCP-376 other than the existing security at the secure agriculture facility. Description SCP-376 appears to be in a regular traffic light, with an excessive amount of components attached, resembling more of a tree than a standard traffic light. However, SCP-376 is not a man-made object, but is in fact a naturally occurring organism. It is currently unknown how or why SCP-376 has managed to mimic the appearance of a traffic light. Testing has revealed that the exterior of SCP-376 is composed of organic material rather than steel, similar to wood found in regular trees. The bark that it produces hardens to form a protective coating around SCP-376 that takes the appearance of steel. However, 
While the bark does appear and feel like steel to the touch, it is not nearly as strong, being only able to withstand stresses similar to regular tree bark. The light that SCP-376 produces is a form of bioluminescence, which it is able to manipulate to glow in the three colors commonly associated with traffic lights. Red, green, and yellow. SCP-376 is somehow able to control which light activates, and does so in a predictable sequence, though it is not known how or why. Extended observation of SCP-376 shows that it has an uncontrolled growth rate, necessitating constant care and trimming. Each individual traffic light begins as a bud, but will quickly mature into a full-size traffic light within several minutes. The appearance of a new light on SCP-376 typically happens every 9 to 10 days. Removing one of the lights causes it to cease functioning, and the wound caused in SCP-376 will immediately be closed by growing extra bark. If left alone, the detached light will eventually biodegrade and rot like any other organism. Unlike other plants, SCP-376 does not use photosynthesis to sustain itself. Instead, its roots will dig through the pavement and ground towards the nearest power line. SCP-376's roots are capable of penetrating underground power lines and patching into them, effectively attaching itself to the local power grid. SCP-376 uses the electricity it obtains as the primary energy to create its food. In terms of reproduction, SCP-376 has a unique method of propagating itself. Rather than using regular spores or seeds, SCP-376 is able to transfer seedlings through the power grid it is connected to, meaning that a new instance of SCP-376 can be created anywhere the power lines reach. SCP-376 was found during rush hour in California on a busy intersection. The entire event was explained as an art exhibition, and SCP-376 was promptly relocated to its current location in the Secure Agriculture Facility. Experiment Log 376A Once it was discovered that SCP-376 required electricity to survive, it was attached to Site's power grid. This mistake was quickly realized when on-site staff began reporting the appearance of additional traffic lights scattered around the facility. Once these lights were removed, SCP-376 was connected to a separate power grid that was laid under a specially constructed test area. After analyzing the results, it was discovered that SCP-376 is somehow able to discern which areas it can grow without arousing undue suspicion. All recorded test subjects were reported to grow in areas where traffic light placement would be logical. There is currently no explanation to how SCP-376 is able to control where it grows so effectively. Experiment Log 376B After continued testing, it became known that SCP-376 is not restricted to just traffic lights. After several weeks of observation, it was noted that additional structures began appearing. So far, the forms instances of SCP-376 can take include but are not limited to fire hydrants, power lines, street lights, and street signs. Experiment Log 376C After additional testing and observation, it was discovered that the SCP-376 currently contain is an abnormality, even among its own kind. DNA comparison between itself and other subjects show that it is suffering from some kind of defect that causes it to grow uncontrollably, which could explain how it was discovered so quickly. Addendum 1 After cross-analyzing Department of Transportation records and total national power consumption, Foundation analysts have estimated that there may be as many as data expunged instances of SCP-376 in the continental United States alone. Containment teams are currently being mobilized to search for these instances. Item Number SCP-392 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures All living SCP-392 instances are to be held in a standard greenhouse sector at Biological Research Site 103. Population of SCP-392 instances is to be kept maintained at an upper limit of 10. 
selected SCP-392 seeds are to be extracted and kept in cryonic storage at Biosite 103. Description SCP-392 is an artificial plant species created via Davite thaumaturgy, resembling the species Prunus persica, peach. According to a Chronicle of the Divas, creation of SCP-392 was attributed to Divite matriarch Wok of the Wok clan, circa 800 BCE. While originally perceived as an act of social deviance in Divite society, Cultivation was tolerated and adopted by matrilineal descendants of the Wok clan, located in contemporary Central Asia and Xinjiang, China. While SCP-392 is physiologically similar to that of P. persica, one significant difference is that SCP-392 does not produce fruits from the ovary upon flowering. Instead, it produces a series of physically identical male human heads. DNA analysis indicates that they are of the same individual. As the tattoos found on the heads are indicative of human concubinus belonging to Divite matriarchs, it is postulated that the heads grown from SCP-392 represent a human concubinus of the matriarch Wakwak. The physiology of heads grown from SCP-392 is mostly identical to that of a human, although the heads lack eyelids and the seed for SCP-392 is located at the prefrontal cortex. In addition, the heads are capable of responding to external stimuli, as indicated by various reflex actions. PET scans of attached heads have identified neural activity in the brain. Notably, rate of eye movement and neural activity are consistently higher when female humanoid figures are within the head's visual axis as compared to other types of objects. Below is an abridged list of reflex actions and responses obtained from heads grown from SCP-392. Experiment Log 3921 Test 392-01 Subject D-690 Protocol D-690 is instructed to wave her hand in front of a head attached to SCP-392. Results Irises of the head move according to the movement of D-690's hand. Test 392-2 Subject D-690 Protocol D-690 is instructed to caress a head attached to SCP-392. Results Irises of the head move toward the region where it is touched. Jaws of the head open at approximately 5 degrees. No vocalization produced. Test 392-3 Subject D-690 Protocol D-690 is instructed to place her lips over the lips of a head attached to SCP-392. Results Mouth of the head opened and tongue extended in an attempt to touch D-690's lips and tongue. When detached from SCP-392, neural activity and reflex actions from the heads will cease. The heads can be plucked, or will fall from the plant naturally via barakery. When detached from SCP-392, the head will gradually undergo decomposition, allowing the seed to be exposed to water and oxygen. Decomposed matter from the head will then serve as an organic fertilizer for germination. SCP-392 was discovered in the Katsura Imperial Villa at Kyoto, Japan, on Expunged, 1945. Ties to Divite culture are later identified via cross-reference of tattoos found on the heads, and this document is subsequently updated with relevant findings from Divite sources known to the Foundation. Addendum 3921 SCP-392 instances planted at Kyoto was conducted during the Pacific War as part of a ritual to pray for national prosperity. Those specimens originated from a single SCP-392 seed, which was among the gifts from Emperor Yang of the Sui Dynasty in response to tribute sent by Japanese envoys. This practice originated from a description of SCP-392 by the envoy Ono no Imoko alleging it to be a symbol of prosperity only found in the households of nobility. Addendum 3922 Due to the mention of the Sui Dynasty and confirmation of Divide involvement, 
A copy of A History of China, altered by SCP-140 to include Devite Chinese interactions, was consulted for additional information. The book mentioned SCP-392 as one of the items looted from captured Devite cities by Chinese soldiers as early as the Warring States period, circa 475 BCE to 221 BCE. SCP-392 would be cultivated by these soldiers, who harvested and skinned the heads. The skulls would then be passed off as executed enemy combatants and presented to officials in exchange for promotion and other rewards, e.g. peerage titles, lands, and slaves. The descendants of many clans involved in SCP-392 cultivation gained prominent positions in various Chinese dynasties, up to the imperial families of various dynasties. Addendum 392371 Specialized Containment Proposal Project Yin Yang Subcategory Argus 100 the following proposal consists of a cross-test between SCP-392 and SCP-2733. Usage of SCP-392 and SCP-2733 circumnavigate ethical issues regarding the use of a live human and long-term maintenance of a live observer. Said cross-test consists of the following phases. 1. One D-Class personnel will be involved in the tending of SCP-392 for a period of one month and will not be involved in other SCP projects. This is to facilitate priming. 2. Said personnel will then be instructed to open SCP-2733 while thinking of SCP-392. Due to SCP-2733's anomalous effects, it is hypothesized that a head will manifest. 3. SCP-2733 will be kept open for a test period of one year to examine long-term survival of the head. If long-term survival of the head is possible, further application under Project Yin Yang, subcategory Argus 100, will be considered. Item Number SCP-407 Object Class Neutralized Special Containment Procedure At time of acquisition, SCP-407 was recorded within a compact cassette tape. Currently, SCP-407 is backed up as a digital audio file on Data Expunged. SCP-407 should not be allowed to play under any circumstances outside testing conditions, and only with the approval of O5. Testing of SCP-407 is to be done in completely soundproof environments. All tools and subjects must be sterilized to remove the presence of pollen, fungal spores, plant seeds, and as much bacterial life to the greatest degree possible to delay the negative effects of SCP-407. Description SCP-407 is a song in an unidentified language, seemingly sung a cappella. The voices are thought to be human. The tape containing SCP-407 was found with one track of approximately 30 minutes duration, though the abrupt ending suggests there may be more. The song has been described by all listeners as something along the lines of soothing, glorious, and beautiful. While SCP-407 is played, rapid cell generation seems to occur with an auditory radius. This effect seems to occur at the cellular level and does not require the subject to be able to hear the music. The changes seem to only affect multicellular organisms at first, but quickly begins to affect mitosis in single-celled organisms. During the first minute of exposure, all multicellular life forms seem to become healthier. Subjects suffering from malnutrition, scarring, physical injury, or chronic diseases or other medical conditions seem to become healthy within only a minute of exposure to SCP-407. This has been shown to cure Alzheimer's disease, Crohn's disease, brain and spinal cord injuries, and normally fatal infections or wounds, amongst other things. Interestingly, cancer does not seem to be affected, though the subject's physical condition was still vastly improved. During the second and third minute of exposure, Subjects start experiencing unnecessary unrestrained cell growth, 
manifesting in quickly advancing dermal growths. These growths seem to mostly be benign tumors and calcium and fat deposits, which though sometimes painful and disfiguring, are not life-threatening. During the fourth minute of exposure, increased bacterial and fungal growth occurs, creating conditions that grow increasingly dangerous for all exposed life, even in their new healthier states. Respiratory and digestive problems are quick to arrive in most cases, and become steadily worse as time progresses. Past five minutes, the effects of SCP-407 seem to differ each trial. In all cases, trace elements of plants or fungus, as well as any animal life present, begin to grow and replicate uncontrollably, at varying rates, often shaping into new organisms. Full results have varied depending on the test and on the objects present when SCP-407 is played. Addendum 4071 SCP-407 was found in the home of Professor who had recently returned from research in the Amazon regions of northern Brazil. Agents were first alerted to a possible SCP when data expunged. Addendum 4072 The mold that eventually resulted from SCP-407's second test appears to be some sort of cordyceps fungi, noted to be similar to mold encountered by SCP-507. Due to fear of fulfilling a fate similar to that observed by 507, testing using SCP-407 has been limited to using only the first 20 minutes of the recording. Addendum 4073 Experiment Log 407 SCP-407 Test Notes Test 1 SCP-407 played for 28 minutes and 32 seconds. 1 D-Class Personnel Testing Area Unsterilized 25 seconds Subject reports taking a great liking to music and can be observed attempting to hum along. 45 seconds Subject reports her knee, which had been injured for years, is no longer hurting and is working well. 125 Subject begins doing push-ups. Subject is seemingly euphoric at her physical state. Subject looks younger and shows considerable growth in musculature. 3 minutes. Subject stops exercise, reports dizziness and stomach cramps. Subject begins scratching left arm. 3 minutes 40 seconds. Subject is suffering from uncontrollable diarrhea and appears to be in great pain. Dermal clavi are seen appearing on left arm. Small weeds are seen growing in various parts of the testing chamber. Four minutes. Corns on subject's skin are seen spreading quickly throughout body, taking on a whitish hue. Subject communicates that she no longer feels pain. Four minutes and 30 seconds. Subject's skin is completely covered in thick, uneven, calloused skin. Subject no longer communicating. Chamber floor and walls seeing advanced plant growth. 5 minutes 10 seconds. Subject no longer moving and is barely recognizable as skin disfigurement continues. D-class uniform on subject disintegrating for unknown reasons. 6 minutes 45 seconds. Subject is completely unrecognizable as human. Appears as a large mound of calloused flesh. The subject's new form can be seen expanding and contracting slowly. Fern-like plants are seen growing on and around the subject. 7 minutes 10 seconds. Chamber completely covered in various weeds, plants, and ferns. Majority of species are not recognizable. 7 minutes 55 seconds. Foliage in chamber is extremely thick, many of the observed plants reaching the roof. Mound originating from original subject has grown larger and seen expanding and contracting rhythmically. 8 minutes 30 seconds. Plants begin taking on a yellow tinge, as if wilting. 10 minutes 30 seconds. All plant life within test chamber has died and quickly decomposed into mulch. Mound is still seen expanding and contracting and has grown about 2 meters wide and about the same in height. 11 minutes. A variety of molds and mushrooms are seen growing throughout the chamber on the mulch of the deceased plants. Large mouth-like openings, complete with observed sets of teeth, 
have appeared on the outside of the expanding and contracting mound in the middle of the test chamber. 13 minutes 30 seconds. Diversity of fungal life in chamber greatly increased. Fungal forms are seen growing upon one another and upon the mound originating from the primary subject, which is still seen expanding and contracting. 15 minutes. Hand-like structures seen growing in pairs on outside of mound. Fungal life in chamber still abundant. 16 minutes 10 seconds. Hand-like structures seem to have developed eyes. Soon after eyes open, the structures detach from central mound and become mobile. Hands are seen dragging themselves towards particular fungal species, breaking off pieces, and then dragging themselves and the pieces into the mouth-like holes. 18 minutes. Majority of fungal material disappearing as more and more hands feed fungal material into the central mound. 19 minutes 30 seconds. Various plant shoots are seen growing. All species are completely unrecognizable. Only remaining fungal growths are those on the chamber ceiling. Yellowish vapors are seen coming from the central mass. 21 minutes. One of the organisms formerly identified as a plant is seen to become ambulatory. Organisms appear to grow from small, stationary, pod-like plants into adult mobile forms, which use several barbed tendrils to drag themselves throughout the chamber. They are observed to scale both the walls and ceilings of the test chamber. Though about half the size of the hand-like organisms, the plant-like organisms seem to possess sharp mandibles, which they use to destroy and consume the majority of the hand-like beings. 23 minutes. Plant-like organisms begin devouring hand-like growths that continue growing from the central mound as soon as they develop a working eye. 23 minutes and 40 seconds. Plant-like organisms are seen feeding fungal material from ceiling into the mouths on the central mound. 26 minutes. Plant-like organisms seemingly breed sexually, using directly delivered pollen. Life in chamber seems to be limited to three surviving species. The mobile plant-like organisms, the fungal organism that continues to grow on the ceiling, and the central mound on the floor. 28 minutes 32 seconds. Tape ends. Data expunged. End test 1. Test 2. SCP-407 played for 28 minutes 32 seconds. Within chamber, one D-class personnel, unsterilized. 25 seconds. Subject reports feeling soothed by the music and of feeling stronger and more invigorated. 45 seconds. Liver spots and scars previously seen are shown to disappear. 2 minutes and 20 seconds. Subject appears to have physically grown an inch. Increase in musculature is noticeable. 3 minutes and 40 seconds. Subject reports intestinal pain. 4 minutes and 20 seconds. Subject begins vomiting. From vomit, plants are seen growing and slowly rooting into the tile floor. 4 minutes and 50 seconds. Subject starts developing rashes and growths on skin. 5 minutes and 30 seconds. Heavy dermal disfigurement. Subject panting heavily, begging for help. Great pain reported. 6 minutes 10 seconds. Subject falls to the ground and ceases to move. 6 minutes 45 seconds. Subject's body is quickly covered in what is thought to be fungal infections. Plant growth is observed growing from the subject's mouth, then eye sockets. 7 minutes 30 seconds. Subject is by this time unrecognizable, covered in molds and plant shoots. Body bursts as a banana tree emerges from the subject's intestines and proceeds to grow to maturity within seconds. 8 minutes 45 seconds. Plant and fungal growth has begun to spread throughout the testing chamber. What appears to be moss and weeds cover the floor. 9 minutes 30 seconds. Several shoots, stalks, bushes, and even small trees have appeared. Banana tree is no longer recognizable. The tree has grown thick and is covered with foliage and fungal growth. 10 minutes 30 seconds. The air is heavy with pollen and spores. Vision into testing chamber is difficult. 
11 minutes 30 seconds. Movement is heard within the chamber. Several different small insect-like creatures are observed. Creatures are seemingly made of plant matter. 17 minutes and 30 seconds. For the last 6 minutes, creatures made of plant matter have been observed to rapidly generate, grow to maturity, kill and eat other creatures, and then be eaten themselves. Creatures increasingly progressing in size as time increases. 19 minutes. Medium-sized mammalian creatures are observed. They seem humanoid and bear a resemblance to initial subject. 21 minutes. Large fungal stalk is observed to grow from one of the mammalian creatures. Stalk end bursts, dispensing white spores. 22 minutes. Plant growth is still lush, but everything begins to become coated by a layer of mold. The plant creatures seem to die slowly for an unknown reason, before being covered by the mold. 23 minutes. Mammalian creatures are the last to succumb. They heavily decay and become covered in the same mold. Bodies are shown to contract and expand as if breathing. Stalks quickly rise from the bodies, burst with spores, and then just as quickly rot. 28 minutes 32 seconds. Tape ends. No change in chamber since the appearance of the mold. Chamber undergoes rigorous antibiological cleansing. Samples of the mold were taken. See Addenda 4071-4072. End Test 2. Addendum 4074. SCP-407 has been deleted from the system by what is now known to the Foundation as the Interest Group, Serpent's Hand. All known backup copies of SCP-407 have also been deleted. Refer to the following Incident Report X-23. Security Breach Incident X-23 On date expunged, SCP Site-19 breached by operatives from an organization known to the Foundation only as the Serpent's Hand. Site-19 Breach The breach of Site-19 seems to have been the second of two break-ins into SCP properties by known to the Foundation as L.S. This individual was responsible for a previous security breach, having coordinated the theft of SCP-268. Though data expunged, it is evident from video surveillance that SCP-268 was involved in this infiltration. The intruder known as L.S. seems to have simply walked into Site-19. The intrusion seems to have been for the purpose of using SCP-914. Knowledge of the intruder's use of SCP-914 can only be assumed due to the intruder's interruption of Dr. during routine testing. Dr. seems to have been data expunged, resulting in the intrusion's only personnel casualty. SCP-407 seems to have been deleted from the Foundation system during this time, so it can only be assumed the individuals involved are responsible. Whether this means the file has been completely destroyed, or possibly in the hands of this rogue group, is unknown. A short printed note was found in SCP-914's chamber. This note is the only insight the Foundation currently has of the group responsible for this incident. Document X-23-1 Dear Sirs of the Foundation, Behind guns and protocol you hide, desperately chaining the ineffable yourselves stuck within your own self-wrought pitiful cages of fear and ignorance. You think yourselves the shepherd, guarding the flocks of the unwise over the night, but you are so shaken by doubt and fear that in your bewildered arrogance, you would vainly seek to chain the sun itself unto the heavens to hold back the daily night. The delivering angels themselves you contain with three digits and four walls. Do you not see the blindness with which you walk and swing your blade? On the final day, would you have us contain Black Surtur himself with measures and science, and condemn ourselves to rotten stagnancy as you hold back his pure cleansing fires? I do not ask you not to act, but act with enlightenment and heart. Neither should one be seduced by the dark, nor blinded by the light, but walk firmly in the twilight and gaze unto all realms. Walk the world of fire with bare feet, and you will find yourself without the scars you never knew you had. 
Alas, in your fears, you fail to see the old gods that we all are, and unable to accept this sovereignty, detain both thought and essence of those that would take man beyond the mundane. Do not be so eager to hold back the tides of unrelenting destruction, that you trample what brave weed that would dare grow in the monochrome world you wish to pave. Such blind order stifles chaos, and what is chaos but life? I leave you with one final truth. The garden is the serpent's place. The divinities of fear and order who come to walk in the cool evening air are only visitors. Do not fail to see the evil hiding in the light, nor the aromatic beauty of the palest flower of darkness. Signed sincerely, L.S. P.S. You'll thank me for deleting what you call 407. Item Number SCP-417 Object Class Euclid Potentially Keter Special Containment Procedures Due to SCP-417's inability to be moved safely, SCP-417 remains stationary in the area surrounding SCP-417, 2.58 kilometers squared approximately, is patrolled by guards and bordered with a chain-link fence topped with barbed wire. Civilians are informed that a small village with a highly virulent plague is being quarantined until further notice. Trespassers are to be shot on sight. Only Class D personnel are permitted to directly handle and work with SCP-417. As wild animals seem to instinctively eschew SCP-417, no action need to be taken against animals seen in the enclosed area. All victims bitten by SCP-4171 may be granted immediate euthanasia on request, and their body is to be placed in a sealed container and cremated immediately. Those that do not request will have the same immediate termination, except in the case of test subjects. Description SCP-417 resembles an African baobab tree in general size and structure, though it lacks leaves, giving it a dead appearance. Its bark has a drab, off-color appearance. Despite the absence of leaves, SCP-417 bears fruit every sundown. Small buds form as the sun rises, and the fruit grows and matures quickly over the course of the day, before ripening into pomegranate-sized, hard-husked fruit. This fruit has dark purple-black skin and a mostly smooth texture that grows pebbly as it becomes overripe. This hard husk may be cut or peeled away by hand or with tools. Removal of the skin reveals no fruit or pulp, but a hollow cavity containing several insects, collectively known as SCP-4171. The appearance and species of SCP-4171 change from fruit to fruit, as well as the scope of the ensuing swarm. SCP-4171 will unanimously attack anything that moves, with startlingly painful bites. Within the first few minutes, bites sustained from the swarm swell into painful red sores, with minor puncture wounds. No known remedy will soothe the pain of the bites. In 5% of the recorded cases, bites have no lasting effect and the swelling and pain reduce after a few days. 45% of the time, those bitten will begin to have convulsions and suffer from a fatal heart attack within several hours. At that stage, their body will rot and dissolve at an accelerated rate. In the area where their body had been, a new tree will begin to grow over the course of the next few days. In the remaining 50%, after an indeterminate period of 2 to 24 hours, those afflicted begin to complain of severe pains and muscle atrophy, expelling flesh by data expunged, appear to coincide with the approximate mass of SCP-4171. While growing, the plague trees, as they have been dubbed, are vulnerable to being felled, incineration, and conventional herbicides. SCP-417 cannot be moved, as all attempts to fell or shift the original tree result in severe agitation of the branches, causing all instances of the fruit to fall to the ground, splitting and releasing massive swarms of SCP-4171. Thankfully, SCP-4171 does not seem to survive for longer than one to two hours, dying with little incident. 
If the fruit of SCP-417 is not picked or shaken off the branches, it simply rots on the branches and falls to the ground with no ill effects. Addendum 417A Although SCP-417 is currently listed as a Euclid-class item, its potential for spreading has sparked some argument over a possible transfer to Keter class. Addendum number 417B Notable Specimens of 4171 Several dozen creatures resembling Black Widow spiders, except with only four long cricket-like legs each that allowed for them to make astonishingly long, fast jumps. Twenty wasps with red and orange stripes and wings similar to those of a butterfly, capable of surprisingly fast flight. A single black millipede, five meters long, curled into a ball inside the fruit. Thousands of tiny fruit fly-esque creatures that emitted a high-pitched buzzing. Item Number SCP-437 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures a fenced perimeter has been established around SCP-437. Foundation horticulturalists are to be kept on site to monitor and care for SCP-437-A instances. Testing is prohibited pending review by the Ethics Committee. MTF IOTA 10, Damn Feds, is to investigate all POIs associated with SCP-437 and place them in Foundation custody, along with their children. Description: SCP-437 is a large grove of trees, located in Camp Lakewood, Illinois, USA. It contains 64 instances of SCP-437-A. SCP-437-A are numerous trees common to North America. Each instance has several cankers, atypical interior structures, see below, and, rather than sap, contain significant quantities of human blood. SCP-437 was discovered by the Foundation in 2011, 20 years after the summer camp's closure. Employment records for Camp Lakewood have not been found. All persons who attended Camp Lakewood during the summer of 1991 are persons of interest and are still currently at large. Addendum 437.1 Interview POI-437-15 was brought in after genetic analysis of blood samples from an instance of SCP-437-A led to a match in Foundation Hospital records. Audio Log Date 2014-09-15 Interviewer Agent Bennett Subject POI-437-15 Samantha Blanchett Begin Log Interviewer, did you attend Camp Lakewood in 1991? P-15, is that what this is about? Uh, yeah. That was, wow. Two decades ago? Wow. I was 15, I think. That really takes me back. Interviewer, what do you remember from your time there? P-15, best summer ever. <laughs> It was an amazing place. I was so sad to go, especially when we found out it was closing. I made so many friends there. So many great memories. I think, yeah, it's even where I had my first kiss. Interviewer. Did you ever see any strange trees to the south of the camp? P-15. Huh? Interviewer. Two kilometers to the south, there's a grove of trees. Are you familiar with it? P-15. I mean, sure. We all were. Interviewer. In what sense? P-15. <laughs> I mean, it was goofy kid stuff, you know? Stories the counselors would tell around the campfire. Spooky trees down the southern trail. Something trapped inside of them. Go there at night, press your ear against the bark, and you can hear it singing. Interviewer. Singing. P-15. Yeah. Like I said, goofy kid stuff. Interviewer. Did you ever go there yourself? Silence. Interviewer. Miss Blanchett. P-15. Huh? 
Oh, sorry. No, I never went there. Too scared, I guess. <laughs> that was a pretty crazy summer, you know? Sometimes I really miss that place. End log. Note. Shortly after the interview, POI 43715 escaped custody via unknown, presumably anomalous means. Subsequent investigations found all POIs associated with SCP-437 have been recently reported as missing. Addendum 437.2 Email Update SCP-437 Medical Findings Log Date 2016-0720 From Dr. Weiss To Site Director August Subject Recent Findings Radiographic and ultrasound imaging determined the presence of humanoid skeletal structures and soft tissue in each instance of SCP-437-A. Organs are woven into the trees themselves and appear to be semi-functional. Although severely deformed, most of the bones are consistent with adolescent humans between the ages of 13 and 16. In several cases, deformation of the jaw has been minimal. This allowed us to identify certain instances via dental records taken before 1991. I don't think your POIs are the campers, Jeremiah. I suggest we sub-designate them as part of SCP-437. As for the SCP-437-A instances themselves, I want to look into the possibility of euthanizing them. They've been in there for 20 years. When you press your ear against the bark, you can hear them. It's low and muffled but you can hear them just fine. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.